Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Mavis Jaworski. From acne to rosacea to melanoma, skin diseases are common among patients of all ages. Skin disorders are so prevalent, in fact, that their incidence exceeds those of obesity, hypertension, and cancer. In this edition of Physician Focus, we're going to examine some of the most common and serious types of skin disorders. We'll examine what causes them, how they can be treated, and how patients can protect against them. With me for this discussion are Drs. Ira Skolnick and Pamela Weinfeld. Dr. Skolnick is a physician at Family Dermatology in Concord, Massachusetts, and the president of the Massachusetts Academy of Dermatology, the statewide professional association of physicians specializing in dermatology. Board certified in dermatology, pediatric dermatology, and general pediatrics, he is a fellow of both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Dermatology and has served as Chief of Dermatology at Emerson Hospital in Concord. Dr. Weinfeld is a co-founder of Dermatology and Skin Care Associates, a private medical practice in Wellesley. Board certified in Dermatology, she is a Fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery, and the American Society for Laser Medicine and Surgery. She also serves as the Vice President of the Massachusetts Academy of Dermatology. Welcome, physicians. Clearly, you have all the necessary credentials to be doing this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much for having us. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. So, what I'd like to do is we're going to be covering different conditions, but I think first of all, we really need to have a clear definition of what the term dermatology means. So basically dermatology is the medical specialty that specializes in the treatment of skin, but also in hair and nails. A lot of people forget about the hair and nails part as well. Mm -hmm. So the dermatologist really is your medical expert in skin, hair, and nails. And the other question, too, is how prevalent are skin disorders? I've touched on that a little bit in the intro, but let's go into more detail. How common are the skin disorders? I think that most people in their lifetime are going to have some issues with their skin that they're going to need addressed, um, whether it's as an infant having dry skin or eczema, having acne as a teenager, um, wanting to uh, care for their skin as they get older. I think that most people have uh, some skin issue that they'll seek assistance for during their lifetime, and that's why dermatologists are here to help them. And not only that, I think different age groups typically will have different issues as well. Exactly. And remember and the skin. you could give testimony to that. That's right. I your... see a lot of children in my practice. And of course, um, Woody Allen once said that the brain is his second favorite organ, but the skin is actually the largest organ of the body, and people often forget that as well. So it's uh, an organ like any other organ that we need to take care of and uh, needs help every once in a while. That's right. How about risk factors for different skin conditions? Say, for example, your genetics, where you're born, where you came from, your skin types. Let's talk about those. Sure. Well, people are born with different skin colors, and having uh, less pigment in the skin, for example, puts you at higher risk for skin cancer. Um, some people are born with just drier skin uh, or more oily skin than other uh, than others, and those uh, really the type of skin that you have will determine a lot of um, the different conditions that you might face over your lifetime. But then, you know, everyone does a lot of things to their skin. They they wash their skin, they moisturize their skin, um, they apply things to their skin, and all of those things can be contributing factors as well. So it's really a combination of you know things that you're born with and then things that you do to your skin. And I think the other important. A point to keep in mind too, just because you have fair skin doesn't mean you're going to get a particular condition, nor does it mean that if you have very dark skin that you're not going to get a condition. Exactly. I right. say that because I had seen in the past a gentleman who was from Africa and he had a melanoma on his finger. Yep. So. Actually, in dark skinned people, um, skin cancers, the deadliest form, which is melanoma, the most common place that dark skinned people get it are on the palms and soles of the feet probably because there's less pigment there to protect them. That's what the thought is. Although skin cancer can happen anywhere um, on the body, 
um, even melanoma. Um, I've had patients who have had melanomas in areas where they don't typically see the sun and people think of melanoma as a sun-induced skin cancer mm -hmm. and that is the biggest risk factor for melanoma, um, but it's not uh, the only issue and sometimes things just happen. And so people, uh, even if it's a sun-covered area uh, or they have dark skin, people should be aware of that they should check their whole skin um, and that things can happen really to anyone. And if you have family members who have had certain types of skin cancers, are you at increased risk? Absolutely. Uh, family history for skin cancer in general, any kind of skin cancer, uh, puts you, the individual, at higher risk as well. Usually I tell people if it's a first degree family member, a brother, or sister, father, mother, or even a child, um, when you start talking about uh, history in your uh, grandfather, grandmother, or uncle, or mm. cousin, your risk factor goes down a little bit, but of course you still have some of their genes too, so your risk is not diminished entirely. But usually first degree family relatives. And also think about too what, you're, what you do for a living, for occupation. Are you outdoors a lot? Um, are you an airline pilot? Do you like to fly planes? They get higher, more radiation. Are you an x-ray technician that might be exposed more to radiation? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, you have to keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking of your risk factors as well. I think other occupations that involve a lot of outdoor exposure are teachers. They tend to go outside for recess a lot, and that's a big factor because it might be only a half an hour, 45 minutes a day, but over the school year that really adds up. Um, also people who are uh, working on electrical lines or who are roofers or construction people. Um, in terms of leisure activities, uh, people who are golfers, tennis players, boaters, things that they like to be outside. So when people think about sun exposure, a lot of times they think about laying out on the beach, but you're getting sun exposure whether or not you intend to, even just walking to the store um, or doing other things. It's not necessarily what you're intending to do that is the issue. And sun can travel through windows. That's Ultraviolet right. light can travel. So that's, that's a true. really important point. So the UV B rays that cause a lot of the sun burns are blocked by car windows, but the UVA rays that cause aging, if you want to think of A as aging, cause wrinkles and skin cancer, travel through car windows. So I always tell my patients to factor in their commute, their daily commute in um, their sort of sun total of how much sun they're getting each day. Yeah, and we see more skin cancer to that point um, on people's left arm because of that's the driving arm. That's the arm that sticks out the car window more often and mm -hmm. they get more sun as well, or it even goes through the car window. Well, so. and also the left side of the face, you mm -hmm. can often um, tell that there's a little more wrinkling and a little more sun damage on the left side. Um, it's actually interesting, they've done studies and in England where people drive on the other side of the road, they actually have more skin cancers on the right side compared to the US where there's more on the left. And Australia too, that's where they even get more sun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What are other, um, aspects or exposures that people can have that will really put them at risk for skin cancer other than ultraviolet radiation? Tanning. Okay. That's a big no-no. Uh, I'm proud to say the Massachusetts Academy of Dermatology along with a number of other societies including the Melanoma Foundation of Massachusetts have really done a lot of work in the past 10 years to get a tanning bill through um, which has now gone through uh, the state legislature banning tanning on uh, minors under the age of 18, period, even if they have consent from their parents. Tanning, all it does is just increase your uh, risk for skin cancer later on in life. Uh, the benefits that people call of you know, having a deep, dark tan, um, really that's a societal thing that we need to get away from where you know, the tanner you are, the healthier you look. Uh, we as dermatologists can tell you that uh, we do not consider a tan to be a healthy looking aspect of someone's skin. You know, I think it's wonderful if you're born with pigment in your skin. It's very beautiful, um, but you really have to love this color of the skin that you're born with and not try to change it artificially because melanoma can, um, the increased risk is about 75% if you tan as a teenager. Um, and a lot of teens that I see who've done tanning, they get a lot of moles on their body. Tanning increases the number of moles and the, the look that they're looking for of having this sort of beautiful skin that's all one color is not really something that they get from the tanning booth. So they're not really getting what they think they're getting when they're going to tan. Exactly. Well, you know, a lot of people that are over the age of 18 
they plan winter vacations in a sunny place and they say, oh, I have to go to the tanning booth. I've got to get my skin ready. So when people say, say that to, to me, I hear that all the time in I do January too. and February. So I say, well, let me put it to you this way. That's like saying, well, I'm going to be at a party tonight. And I'm not a smoker, but a lot of people around me are going to be smoking. And I'm going to be breathing in those fumes. So I think I need to smoke a little bit during the day today to get my lungs ready and built up. <laughs> So when you say that to somebody in your office, they realize it kind of sounds ridiculous. And I want to point out to them that getting a base tan before you go on vacation is also a little bit on the ridiculous side. <laughs> That's very well put. I will always remember that analogy for sure. Now let's talk about protectants for the skin so that when you're going on vacation, you enjoy yourself, but you don't get crispy. So the most important thing to do is actually to wear sun protective clothing. The more covered your skin is, um, the better. And you don't have to reapply a sun shirt or a hat, which is really nice. Um, on the other hand, sun protective clothing doesn't cover every single part of your body and it is important to wear sunblock. Um, and the, some of the best sunblocks have zinc and titanium, which are ingredients that are physical blockers that block the sun's rays. Um, some of the chemical blockers um, degrade in sunlight and so they don't last as long as the physical blockers. Um, also these days, a lot of people are concerned about chemicals and putting things on their skin. So a nice physical block with zinc or titanium, a lot of people feel that that's safer than putting chemicals on. But when I think about the safety of sunblocks, I always think about that with the, with the sun, you're dealing with a known carcinogen. So people say to me sometimes, well, what if the sunblocks cause cancer? And I always say, well, with the sun, we know it causes cancer. So you're dealing with a known risk versus a potentially possible unknown risk. So it's definitely safer to use the sunblock. I think some people also think that if they wear a t-shirt, that is protecting their skin. And so the fabric that they're wearing, it really needs to be protective as well. And t-shirts are not protective. A cotton t-shirt has an SPF of what? Guess. Just guess. Zero. It's actually seven. Seven. Well, so that's... That's low. That's so low. You, you're, but people think it's probably like the same thing as putting a 60 on their skin. And so they, you're better off putting a 60 all over your skin as long as you cover everything than, and wearing no shirt than you are just wearing a cotton shirt with the false sense of security that you're covering up. The only thing you want to be careful of though, using your analogy, is that if you're putting your 60 all over but you're wearing that one application all day, it's probably better to have the right. t-shirt because better to over reapply. time, right. right, that 60 degrades and so after a couple of hours you need to reapply whereas right. at least you don't have to put the t-shirt on yeah. again once it's, it's on. It's another thing so. I tell people too is that a lot of people think they put sunscreen on at, you know, in the middle of the summer, they put it on at eight in the morning and they think they're good for most of the day. Exactly. And the truth is, is sunscreen is really meant to be reapplied about every two hours. In fact, here's a little interesting uh, little statistic, but if you take a bottle of sunscreen and you have the SPF on the outside when it's labeled, the way the FDA um, requires manufacturers to label their sunscreen is that that's the SPF you're getting. Um, if you apply a cap full of the, uh, of the sunscreen to a small portion of your body and reapply it every two hours. Mm -hmm. And a bottle of sunscreen is meant to last an adult during the summer if used correctly and regularly. It's meant to last three or four days. Mm -hmm. Now, who among us has a sunscreen that we go through every three or four days? That's, you know, usually it lasts us half the summer or... But really, if you're using the, way, using the sunscreen the way the manufacturer is intending it, then you should be going through sunscreen a lot more often. One way I like to think about it is um, people know about what a shot glass is. And so it's about you know, an ounce um, for an application of sunblock. That's a, the amount you should be putting on your body with one application. So right, that eight ounce bottle should be about eight applications to the adult body. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing too to keep in mind is a lot of times, um, Parents are very good at putting the sunblock on their children, but they're neglecting themselves. So I like to tell people, reapply every even hour. Great idea. So if it's near 10, noon, 2, and even if you think the sun is going down, if it's still daylight, put 
the sunblock on. Well, and another good time is to remember that even on a cloudy day, those rays go right through the clouds. Mm. So even if it's drizzling or cloudy, you still want to put your sunblock on. And along with parents um, protecting their kids, but not themselves, when your children are playing outdoor sports and you're watching them, you should be putting on sunblock. Because again, if you're not on the beach, you don't have that trigger to put your sunblock on. But if you're mm. outside doing other activities, you should be thinking about sunblock. That's correct. One nice thing I like to tell my patients is that when you're on vacation, you like to relax anyway. The sun is strongest between 10 and 2, but especially around noontime is mm. the, when the sun is the absolute strongest. So to protect your skin, I usually tell people to go in for lunch. So don't stay out on the beach the whole day. Take That's a, a break point. in the middle of the day. Take a little siesta lunch, nap, you know, shopping, indoor excursion, something like that, and then That's go back out later to avoid that, that strongest sun. Sure. Good rule of thumb is if you're outdoors in the middle of the summer, and your shadow is shorter than you are, then the sun is very high in the sky and it's probably very intense. So those days and uh, summer days when it's after four or five o'clock and you have the very long shadow, sun is lower, less, less, of a, less of an issue. But we want people to be sure and watch where they're going, not watch the shadows. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and still put your sunblock on. <laughs> so we're speaking about exposure to sunlight and skin cancer. Well, there's different types of skin cancers. Who would like to discuss the different types? Well, I'll just start with an overview. There's really three types, uh, three most common types of skin cancer that we see uh, in our practices on a daily basis. Uh, there's basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then the deadliest form is melanoma. Basal cell being the most common type seen in our country. Uh, usually face, sun exposed areas face, um, hands, arms. Um, we can show a picture of what a basal cell looks like. And um, people are, are always expecting a melanoma to be black. Not necessarily. Uh, melanomas come in different shades and um, uh, we'll show you a picture of what a melanoma looks like in just a second. Now the basal cell carcinoma that you've got here is an excellent example on the nose because you also see the small little fine uh, blood vessels there that are somewhat of a giveaway. Right. And a lot of people think that that can just be a mole, but it's not. Correct. So let's take a look at the squamous cell carcinoma. Pam will show that. Squamous cell tends to look a little bit more reddish. It can be a little flatter. And I think one of the giveaways of squamous cell too is it can be unusually scaly. Mm -hmm. um, a sort of scale where you wouldn't expect scale. Now that doesn't mean that every time you have something red and scaly on your body you need to panic, mm -hmm. but that might be a sign that you need to have it checked by a physician. I think it's important to know that both basal and squamous cell skin cancers, the skin is usually more fragile than the skin, uh, the normal skin. So you often get more easy bleeding or crusting compared to a normal skin, um, normal skin spot. So if you have a new lesion or an old lesion that is not healing, you need to get it checked. Correct. For sure. I Let's usually tell patients if there's like an acne bump that hasn't healed after about a month or a crusty spot that they thought was a sore, they thought they hit themselves, but a month later it's still there, they should definitely get it checked out by a doctor. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cancers never just go away on their mm -hmm. own. That's sort of the definition of a cancer. It's something that just keeps reproducing mm. until somebody stops it from an mm -hmm. outside force, whatever that force is, whether it's surgery. So something that is uh, non-healing, that's a, le a, a spot on the skin that is continuously growing, really should be checked. Um, let's take a look at melanoma. So melanoma, of course, is the deadliest form of skin cancer. Um, Luckily, it's a little more rare than the other forms of skin cancer, but unfortunately, in our country and across the world, it's still on the rise. Mm. We're seeing more and more cases of this. And you can see in this picture, one of the giveaways of melanoma is that the borders, uh, the surrounding edges of the spot mm -hmm. are not even. They're not a nice uniform circle. Mm -hmm. They're sort of jagged and irregular, and also the color. If you th draw an imaginary line down the middle of the mole, the two halves don't look alike. Mm -hmm. They're what we call asymmetric, where one half doesn't look like the other and the color is a little bit off. Maybe you have some, not just an even light brown, but more of a black or even a blue pigment within it. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's important to know that while that's the most common description of melanoma, things that are jagged or multicolored, that any mole that's different from your usual pattern is something that should get checked out by a doctor. There are some melanomas that are not jagged or multicolored, but they're much, much, much darker than all your other moles, or they're bright pink when your typical moles are brown. So anything that really stands out from your other spots is something you should get checked out as well. And it's also important we make it a point to get our teeth checked on a regular basis. Why not get your skin checked on a regular basis as well? And spouses sometimes are pretty good at finding something, saying, oh, you've got this thing on your back. But you still need to make sure that you're getting a thorough skin exam when you're going in. Yeah, whether it's with your primary care physician or with a specialist. Exactly. The funny thing is, is, you know, in a state like Florida where they get a lot of sun exposure, um, I think the people who live down there will tell you that they consider their dermatologist part of their primary care physician team. Right. They are. <laughs> the American sure. Cancer Society recommends a yearly skin check for folks over the age of 50. Um, there are different recommendations from different um, task forces and different groups, but I think that's a really good one to go by. Certainly that's if cool. you're 50 or over, and definitely if you have pale skin, you should be checked by a dermatologist. Mm. And then that person can tell you how often you need to come back and get screened. Right. You may need to go more often if you've already had a history of skin cancer or there's a family history or you're at higher risk for the reasons mm -hmm. we already mentioned. We have just a few minutes left. I wanted to touch on acne, if I could. Any new information about acne? Well, you know, there's been a lot of, we always try to find an association. We've been trying for 50 oh, to yes, 100 years. Oh, yes, chocolate food. Correct, chocolate food. And, you know, we, acne is sort of a little bit of an unknown. You know, luckily it's one of those conditions where it definitely can be very, very debilitating to people, very debilitating. And if you're a teenager with acne, there's really nothing worse in the world to right. all some people. But the fact of the matter is, is we, there's not a lot of great basic science research going on about acne. We wish there were more, and the research that's being done is excellent, but we really do need more, and it really has to do with funding, because exactly. if there's a limited amount of funding, we right. won't really want to put it towards Well, I, I think the bottom line is there are a lot of really good over-the-counter products now that people can use, but if they're not getting resolution, then they need to see their physician. So That's commonly right. people um, turn to salicylic acid or benzoyl peroxide products over the counter. Mm -hmm. Both of those will help unclog pores. The benzoyl peroxide will also fight bacteria a little bit on the skin. But after about six weeks of using one of those over-the-counter treatments regularly, if you don't see improvement, you should see your doctor because there are some great acne treatments. Some of them are even just topical creams that you can apply to help keep the pores open and make the acne go mm -hmm. away. And of course, we have more significant medicine for those who need it. Um, we have everything from topicals to oral medicines, um, just for a wide range of acne patients. People do not have to get scars from acne in this day and time. It is manageable. We literally have three minutes left here, and I just wanted to touch on a topic that affects a lot of people, and that's eczema. What are the terms for eczema, and what is it? So I like to think about eczema in two categories just to be, you know, simple and understand it more clearly. You know, people either have very, very dry skin and that in itself causes irritation or possibly they're reacting to something that they're putting on their skin, like an allergic type of reaction that shows up as eczema. And for you know both of those, um, their skin looks dry and irritated and is itchy. Um, if you have um, more of just a dry skin, then you can usually improve it a lot with great moisturizers, reducing harsh soap use, um, those sorts of things. Um, if there's an allergy component, often we have to change around the products, figure out what product uh, the patient is reacting to and simplify their regimen. So that's where a doctor really could um, help the patient guide right. them through the different treatment options. And I think one important thing to keep in mind too, uh, if it's winter months, a lot of people want to take a nice long hot bath or a hot shower and that is not the thing to do if right. you have eczema. It feels good. We all like taking hot showers or going to jacuzzi or something in the uh winter time but the fact of the matter is is the hot water actually draw, draws water out of your skin that's why when you come out of a hot shower long hot shower you're all pruney your hands are all pruney well that's just the water molecules in your shower or your bath 
taking the water out of your skin. And if you don't moisturize right away, I tell my patients usually within about 10 minutes with a nice thick moisturizer, uh, then you're actually gonna dry your skin out even more. I think it's important to mention that aspect of thick. Something you scoop, not something you pump. Right, right. that's exactly right. So dermatologists like to separate um, things that you apply to your skin into um, ointments, creams, and lotions. And patients aren't often aware that there really is a difference between those, but the ointments are the thick sort of petrolatum, really greasy kind of things. And those are actually best because they really lock in all of the moisture and all of the oils of the skin. Creams would come in a jar, so they're still a little bit thick, but not as thick as ointments. And then lotions are those pump things that are very thin and watery. Those usually aren't doing as much as patients need, especially in the cold winter months. If people really like lotions, I often tell them they could layer it, put the lotion on first, and then put the ointment on top. Um, and if people have trouble tolerating ointments, I often tell them that they can put them on right before they go to sleep at night. Um, and as long as their sheets aren't too fancy, they can put their <laughs> ointment on. It's like a spa treatment for your skin overnight to have the ointment on overnight. That's great. So we have just a bit of time left. So I'd like for each of you to share a pearl. Sure, well, um, the two questions patients ask me most are about what they should do for their skin. Um, and a lot of times they also ask me about vitamin D. So the most important thing they can do for their skin, both medically and cosmetically, is to wear a daily sunblock. So every morning put a moisturizer on with a 30 sunblock minimum. I think that's very important, both medically and cosmetically for their skin. Um, in terms of vitamin D, people worry a lot about vitamin D. And I think that if they're concerned that they're not getting enough sun, they're being very protective, then they should have a vitamin D level checked. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, it's stored by the skin, and so you really need to know your level so you don't overdose or underdose with vitamin D. Ira. We talked about a lot of skin conditions today, and there's certainly a lot we didn't talk about. I think the one pearl I'd like to leave people with is, the skin is an organ that you can actually see yourself. It's not like hypertension or heart disease where you can't see it. So if you see something on your skin that looks different, or it worries you, or you're not sure, that's something to have checked out by your physician. And if your physician feels that you need a specialist, he or she can refer you to a dermatologist. Great, thank you. I want to thank the two of you for being guests today. It's been a very informative show for our viewers. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. For more information on skin disorders and what you can do to protect your skin, please visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Mavis Jaworski. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Pamela Weinfeld. I'm Dr. Iris Skolnick. Our skin is the largest organ in our bodies and serves the important functions of controlling our body temperature and protecting us from bacteria and viruses. Our skin is also subject to many diseases and disorders. The most serious of these is melanoma, a deadly cancer that will claim an estimated 10,000 lives this year. If caught early, however, melanoma is highly curable. The best way to detect this condition is to examine your skin regularly. Look for changes such as skin that bleeds, crusty spots that don't heal, or moles that are irregular in size, shape, or color. Prevention is also essential. Limiting exposure to ultraviolet rays of the sun and avoiding tanning beds are the most important steps you can take. When outside, wear protective clothing like hats and long sleeves, seek shade, and use a sunscreen with an SPF of 30 or higher. For more information on skin cancer and skin disease and protecting your skin, visit the American Academy of Dermatology. I'm Dr. Melissa Wood. And I'm Dr. Nandita Scott. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming nearly 400,000 lives each year, more than all cancers combined. Yet nearly half of women are unaware that heart disease, along with stroke, pose the biggest threats to their health. It is important that women recognize their risk factors for heart disease. Amongst the biggest risks are family history and age. Heart disease that has affected a brother, sister, father, or mother is a particular concern, and the risk rises as we get older. The good news is that many other risk factors can be controlled with lifestyle changes. Keep your blood pressure and cholesterol in check, don't smoke, 
eat a healthy diet, exercise, and maintain a healthy weight. We urge you to talk with your health care provider and get screened to determine your risk of heart disease. For more information, visit the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org.